Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. Joining me today is M. Nolan Gray, a professional city planner with experience working on the front lines of zoning policy in New York City. He's an affiliated scholar with the Mercatus Center and currently completing his PhD in urban planning at UCLA. He is the author of the new book, Arbitrary Lines, How Zoning Broke the American City and How to Fix It. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Nolan. Thanks for having me, Trevor. It's a pleasure to be here. To start and getting into the nitty gritty because it's important, I think, to establish this as you do in the book at the outset. What is zoning and what isn't zoning, too, on top of that? So we're clear about what we're talking about here. Yeah, great way to start the conversation. So, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to write the book was um, I found that, you know, a lot of people were thinking about zoning. Uh, a lot of people had strong feelings about zoning. Uh, in many cases, they had the right opinions about zoning. Uh, but they didn't have a very clear sense for what zoning is or where zoning came from. Uh, you know, as you say, I think a lot of people tended to think zoning and planning were interchangeable, or maybe they thought that zoning had something to do with building safety regulation, or they thought that you know zoning and historic preservation were all one and the same thing. Uh, so I start the book by first with a history of what zoning is and where it comes from. And I sort of break zoning down, I think, in a, in a, in a pretty agreeable way uh, to two things. So the first is zoning is trying to segregate different land uses. Um, so zoning, of course, most people know this, breaks the city out into residential, commercial, and industrial zoning districts. But then with the, within each of that, there, of course, you know, ex- there's extreme granularity there. So you might have a residential district that allows, uh, you know, apartments and then you might have a residential district that only allows maybe a single family home on a two acre lot, right? And legally nothing else can be built. Uh, or within commercial, you might have a commercial district that allows maybe let's say a supermarket and some office buildings. And then you might have a, a, a commercial district that only allows maybe office space, right? Um, so there's incredible uh, um, you know, granularity within the system. So in many cases you look at um, zoning maps and they don't look, you know, uh, like a, a simple, you know, three district breakout. Like I think a lot of people do, uh, they're incredibly complex and confusing. Uh, the second thing that zoning is trying to do is it's trying to restrict density. So it's saying, you know, we're going to put artificial constraints on how much floor area you can build for a commercial development or how many units you can build on any one lot. And those are kind of the two pillars of, of what zoning is. And I think when you when you appreciate, you know, those are the two things that zoning's doing. It's not doing all these other things that we think city planning is doing. For example, like streets planning or parks planning, where I, I don't really think there's like a lot of controversy that that these are important functions of municipal government. Um, you know, maybe some of the more extreme uh, libertarianism listeners, but I would contend that they're probably not that um, controversial. Uh, but when you realize that, that zoning kind of has nothing to do with those more uh, prosaic planning functions. Uh, I think it becomes much easier to make a case for abolishing it. And to be clear, you mentioned it, the different rules for density, uh, and use and density are not, and were not even originally sold as say fire prevention or health and safety to stop say pollution from being in residential zones. They, they weren't even sold that way. They are explicitly about stopping people from moving in where they would otherwise move in or use the land in a way they would otherwise. And I think that second point is important because if they wouldn't use the land in such a way, then you wouldn't need a law, right? If, they, if there was no one who wanted to build higher density housing, then it would you presumably wouldn't even need a rule that said you can't build higher density housing. So it is stopping that and not for the purposes of health and safety or anything like that. That's a really good point. And you know, every now and then I'll be talking to a planner uh, and making an argument for, hey, you know, you should consider getting rid of some of these parking mandates, or you should consider allowing for uh, more housing in this district. And they'll say, oh, well, why would we bother allowing it? Uh, no one would build it anyway. Um, <laughs> to which I say, well, then why do you have the rule in the first place, right? Um, no, but I think you're exactly right. I think there's a comforting myth that you hear within planning a lot of goes something like this, right? Okay, early 20th century, um, The American city is changing dramatically. Uh, Transportation technology and building technology is changing what cities look like. That's all true. Um, But you had maybe industry moving into residential neighborhoods, uh, or you had growth that was occurring just completely untethered from any infrastructure investment. Uh, And that's why we needed zoning. We needed zoning to come in and solve those two problems. Um, This is, I think, a sort of modern rewriting of the origins of zoning. Um, 
you know, in the first chapter, I spent a lot of time talking about where zoning comes from. And I highlight two of the first cities to adopt zoning, which I think are indicative of the system we ended up with, but in very different ways. So the first is New York City. Both of these cities adopt uh, zoning in 1916. The first is New York City, pretty famous uh, 1916 zoning ordinance. Um, and you read a lot of some of the stuff that they were saying, right? They were saying like, well, we had too much, you know, we have too much uh, office space getting built in, in lower Manhattan, and that's causing a strain on the subway, uh, which was at the time, of course, a private system. Uh, we, you know, we have too much industry getting built next to the Fifth Avenue Association or the Fifth Avenue Shopping District, a very posh shopping district. And with modern eyes, you read this and you think, well, those are those are pretty valid, like, you know, justifications for for land use regulation. Right. But then you sort of scratch at the surface a little bit and you're like, well, OK, well, like what what's the industry that they were concerned about on Fifth Avenue? Uh, was it like smoke or, or traffic or well, they were they were really worried about the the poor Jewish factory girls who who worked in these factories um, leaving the factory on their lunch break or after work and walking on Fifth Avenue and scaring off the the corridor's elite uh, Anglo clientele. Um, not exactly something that I think the state has a valid interest in, in regulating for. Or you look at the Lower Manhattan case and some of the largest constituencies for, for zoning were incumbent office landlords who basically were seeing office rents uh, stagnate or fall because so much new supply was coming online. Very good for people who for who want to work or or rent office space, very bad for people, the incumbent landowners. Uh, so you see this kind of uh, I think uh, this would be familiar to your listeners. You see these types of Baptist and bootlegger coalitions forming. You have you have planners saying like, "Oh, okay, we need we need to get the smartest people in the room to sit down and come up with a master plan for New York City, and it's going to be great." And then, like just below the surface, it's like you know uh, uh, maybe xenophobic shopkeepers and um, you know incumbent uh, landlords sort of pushing for the system. Similar dynamic in in Berkeley, California, which also adopts single family zoning in 1916, and I think is actually more interesting in the sense that they had single family zoning which fully you know made apartments illegal to build in huge portions of the city and they do something similar they say you know in their documents promoting uh zoning they say you know we need uh, we need this to keep industry out of residential neighborhoods and again you look at that and you're like well of course that makes a lot of sense like i don't want an oil refinery opening up in my cul-de-sac uh but then you know what are the examples give an example of an industry that you don't like <laughs> and uh it's invariably like a chinese laundry or a, a dance hall that was attracting uh, African-Americans, right? And so you're like, okay, well, you know, the nuisance here is not how, you know, I think a normal, uh, well-adjusted person would think of a nuisance. It was very much a social uh, 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 nuisance, as they might put it. Uh, certain types of people were the nuisance to be uh, segregated away. Why 1916? Is I mean, you have the progressive era, of course, and there are a lot of very unsavory policies being discussed, such as eugenics around that time. So is it just part of that? Or was there, you know, some great innovator of zoning, like the Einstein of zoning who came along and suddenly had this idea that became, you know, the talk of the, the nation and all over the nation within 10 years? You know, that's a really good question. Why 1916? I mean, I think, I think there is something to, you know, we, we were in this period of significant change. Uh, I think another element of what's going on is mass car ownership is significantly changing the shape of the city. So whereas historically it was very expensive maybe for a working class household to get out to the suburbs, right? Transportation was just expensive. And, you know, cities had streetcar lines, but the fare could be pretty expensive. Uh, or industry, for example, same thing. Um, you know, there wasn't, they didn't have the type of box trucks that we have today that would allow industry to disperse. And so I think that the, you know, mass car ownership kind of opens up a lot of areas that had previously just been naturally segregated, uh, both in terms of, you know, these socioeconomic factors, but also in terms of maybe a mixture of uses. I think that's a big part of it. I also think, too, the 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 ideological element of this is really important. I think, as you say, we're, you know, we're in the thick of the progressive era here. And there's definitely this notion of, you know, like I was saying earlier, OK, let's get the smartest people in the room. Um, you know, of course, they're all going to be like Anglo guys, you know, with degrees from like Ivy League schools. And they can like they can just think through these problems, right? It's it's very much like the origins of of kind of a modernist, high modernist way of viewing the world that of course is taken to just a, an incredible extreme by the middle of the 20th century. But you're starting to see, I think, some of those ideas there that okay, we you know, we can we can we can actually sit down and comprehensively say what is and isn't allowed on every single lot and at what scale in the city. Um and you know I think there's this this hubris there that's coming out of this time period. You mentioned the single family home and I'm 
I live in a, a neighborhood called Pentagon City in South Arlington in the D.C. area, which is uh, very, very full of single-family homes. Um, probably shouldn't exist. Uh, and, and But functionally, uh, how, how does a zoning ordinance for, say, single-family homes work? Like, what, what, are the, what are the mechanisms by which they restrict it to single-family homes? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would just preface this point by saying, like, I don't judge anyone who lives in a single family home or aspires to live in a single family home. Oh, I'm, I, not, I'm not saying, but I, <laughs> sure, I'm sure, sure that I'm sure this would be high rises in the, in the real world. Uh, but. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think this is, you know, I think this is important uh, as a as a caution here. You know, I my general approach to it is like we need to get rid of a lot of these prescriptive rules that determine what types of housing you can and can't live in and what types of communities you can and can't live in and let people decide for themselves. Right. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure many Americans would like to live in single family homes and there's nothing wrong with that. And, and a post zoning city has probably loads of that. I mean, we'll talk about Houston here in a minute. Um, but I think exactly to your point in a context like Pentagon city, right. Where I think it's, 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 it's Aurora Hills or something that that single family neighborhood that's going to, that's literally just South of the Pentagon and going to be just West of Amazon HQ two. Uh, yeah, it's single family homes on, I, I believe it's 5,000 to 7,500 square foot lots. Um, so what's going on there is essentially a zoning district has been mapped in that area. And it says legally, the only thing you can build on lots in this area are single family homes. And we will just not issue you permits for anything else. Uh, and if you want to build anything else, you can come up and ask us for permission. Uh, but there's going to be a big raucous public hearing. Um, it's going to cost you a lot of money. We're going to you know, squeeze a lot of um, fees and fines out of you. And then you might not even get your permits. Um, and so, you know, I think in, in, in some contexts, right, like single family homes are the highest and best use. And, and that makes a lot of sense. And people who want to form private compacts and private agreements to say, hey, this is going to be the only thing on our street. I think that's perfectly valid. I think where we get into a problem is when you have the state coming in and saying like, hey, we're going to enforce this this uh, extremely strict constraint on what can and can't be here. And that includes, you have good little pictures in the book about, it includes just saying, you know, how the property can be used in there. When you walk around this neighborhood, there are strange little variances that stick out. Like why is there a quadplex here? Uh, which I'm sure has some, its own little story to it, but also setback rules, square footage rules, uh, parking rules. Th these seem maybe even innocuous, but if you actually see how much land is not being used for living, it becomes fairly astounding uh, when you see just how much land is for, say, cars or a, a given size of an apartment that someone has decreed, you know, you can't go higher, lower than this, for example. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I try to get into that in chapter two, this, the, like this regulatory thicket. Like, I mean, this is why I think a lot of people don't fully understand zoning is because there's just so much going on with it. There's so many little rules uh, that, that add up. But, I, you know, I think it's actually a really fun thing to study because once you understand zoning, you can take a walk in your neighborhood and kind of understand why things look the way they do. Exactly to your point, right? Like, why are all the homes on a certain block maybe two and a half stories? Well, if you understand height limits, right, that the city's imposing, you start to see that. Or, uh, for example, setbacks, right? So, of course, you know, there's all this, uh, there's this notion, right, that Americans love their lawns. Uh, you know, we have these huge 25-foot front setbacks and 30 foot rear setbacks. Um, maybe people do like them, but also uh, if they didn't like them, they legally couldn't do anything else because in many cases they're required or exactly to your point about cars, right? I, this is another thing where, you know, I think there's, I'm, I'm living in LA and there's this, of course, this, uh, this saying, you know, uh, uh, this notion of LA Angelinos love their cars. Right. And it's like, well, we kind of don't have any other choice. It's literally illegal to build an apartment building here, except under very, very specific conditions without a developer also having to build a huge parking garage or a huge parking lot. Um, and so, you know, the code writes a very, very these these local zone, zoning ordinances. They're they're very much like social enterprises. I mean, they are regulating the exact form in which you can live in a particular place. Uh, and in many cases, of course, you know, they're. Uh, they're imposing, I would argue, antiquated notions, and they don't reflect maybe changing family structure, or they don't it reflect maybe changing uh, transportation technologies. So how bad is it? I mean, we can sit around and and complain about you know these not these rules not matching up, as you said, with the way people might want to live now. But the costs in terms of in some of these cities, uh, some of the ones in particular, like San Francisco, and you talk about San Jose in the book, like. How bad, how much can we estimate 
how much this is adding to the price of housing and really shutting some of these cities down for people to move in there. Because, you know, I always try and bring up with people, if you think about the image of San Francisco and New York City in American history, that image, you know, you see in movies and, and pictures – is one dominated by by poor people living in those cities. I mean, they're 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 working in the streets. They're maybe living in tenements. I mean, we don't like that, but poor people are living there and moving there for opportunity. And it's kind of crazy that that's just not the case anymore with these cities. So, can we say this is zoning's fault, uh, or a, a huge amount of it is zoning's fault? Yeah, you know, I think it's a really complicated question. I mean, th- there is pretty robust consensus on among the urban economists and 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 folks who have been studying this for decades now that. Uh, land use regulations like zoning are a huge driver of housing costs, particularly in certain regions, exactly like you said, like San Francisco, uh, parts of New England in the Northeast, the West Coast in general. Um, it's just, you know, I would say, uh, as I sketch out in the book, I think zoning makes housing more expensive in three ways. The first is it just allows less of it to get built, right? So this this gets back to like in Los Angeles, for example, in something like, you know, probably at least two thirds of residential areas, it's just illegal to build apartments. You can't build anything more than a single family home. So that's a lot of housing that just can't be built in Los Angeles. And of course, there's enormous demand to live in LA uh, for all its problems. Uh, the weather's fantastic. Uh, and there's great jobs and cool amenities. And people, when they have choice, even if they're working remote, a lot of people say, hey, I want to live in LA. But there's not enough housing to accommodate that. So the existing supply gets bid up and becomes more and more expensive, which drives gentrification. We can talk about that in a minute. Uh, The second element is just uh, increasing housing quality beyond what consumers and developers might actually want, right? So to return to the parking example, some people might demand an off-street parking space with their apartment or with their home. Absolutely. You know, I've been in that situation. But other people, maybe they they might not have a car and they might want to buy or uh, rent an apartment uh, near a transit station or within walking distance of their job. And they don't want a car, but the zoning ordinance forces the construction of an off-street parking space. Or, for example, this is very common in suburbs, you have a regulation that says you can't build a home that's less than 2,000 square feet floor area, or you can't uh, build a home on a lot that's less than 10,000 square feet. Um, You know, all of these things, of course, increase the cost of housing, and they do so in a way that doesn't really reflect any health or safety concern. It's purely just forcing housing consumption to be higher than it might otherwise have been. Um, and again, some people might want that, but the, when you're putting a floor that's so high, you're basically saying like, you have to consume up to this floor. Uh, the third is the permitting delays and the, and the, all of the regulatory chaos that this adds. Right. So, you know, historically, right. The, the way this is meant to work is if you're compliant with building, uh, building codes, which are actually rooted in, you know, health and safety considerations, you come in, you present your plans, you get your permits, um, you, and you start building. And this is how, you know, you look at many great, um, neighborhoods in the U S and I always joke, they were built by some guy and his cousins, right? Like it used to be very easy to get permits and small operators could build maybe something like a, a row of townhouses or a single family home or a small apartment building with, you know, a corner grocery. Um, of course, today, most of those developments would be uh, illegal. You would have to request certain zoning relief. This, of course, involves, you know, raucous public hearings and, of course, lots of fees and concessions being paid. And so it just doesn't happen. Um, and so, of course, this is most this is at its most extreme in a city like San Francisco or Los Angeles or New York or Boston, uh, where just the demand just so dramatically outstrips the supply. Uh, but I think what we've seen over the last two years is that this is kind of creeping nationwide. Right. You know, so I remember when I would have these conversations with maybe someone in a state like Utah or a state like Tennessee two years ago, um, they would be like, oh, that's a Calif- California problem. The Californians just don't know how to run their state. Like uh, and I would warn them, I would say, hey, you know, like. If you actually look at your zoning ordinance, uh, it's just as bad in many cases as these cities. You just have maybe some remaining land on the periphery that you can develop, or you just don't have nearly as much um, demand. Uh, but that's going to change, right? And of course, it has changed and over the last two years, partly because of short-term factors, but also because of these longer-term underlying issues. Uh, the housing crisis has gone national. You mentioned the interesting thing is the price goes up. And you had mentioned that many times, as you might expect, in say 1915, where we can assume that the number of racists was probably higher than today. And one of my general rules of uh, being a libertarian is, you know, if there are a bunch of racists in society, as there have been, as there still are, you shouldn't empower them to use that, use their racism, put government force behind their racism via things like occupational licensing or zoning. Uh, Now, of course, the Supreme Court 
uh, did strike down in Buchanan v. Worley explicitly racist zoning ordinances that just then they used to be quite common, or they were common in the very beginning years of saying no African Americans can't live in this in this neighborhood. But of course, the effect of this just in price and also in terms of intent has contributed to segregation in ways that people do not really appreciate. No, I think that's absolutely right, and that's that's a key part of the early story of zoning, right? So. Um, you have a lot of cities adopt, as you say, explicitly racial zoning. So they say, I mean, very much like a, a South Africa sort of regulatory regime of whites can live here and blacks can live here. And of course, they they tried to frame it to where it's like, oh, it's race neutral. Uh, whites can't move into black areas and, and blacks can't move into white areas. But of course, anyone with any sense knows exactly what's going on. So in 1916, that gets struck down. And what happens in the immediate aftermath of that is a lot of these cities uh, start scrambling for an alternative way to get that type of segregation. And what they settle on is is modern zoning. Because if you can, for example, say, hey, you know, um, the only types of homes you can build in two thirds of our city are 2,000 square foot single family homes on 10,000 square foot lots, and they need to have a two car garage. Well, you've put that's a pretty high price floor to put on housing. And in an American context, in a US context, particularly at that time, the racial implications are pretty clear. So what you get is this sort of reversion to a more class-based segregation to say like, oh, well, if you are if you don't consume at least this much amount of housing, you're not allowed to live in this part of town. And, you know, that's fairly explicit. I mean, a lot of these cities that had their zoning ordinances thrown out after Buchanan v. Worley literally go to some of the early zoning framers and are like, what can you do for us? Um, and in some cases, those early documents like dance around the race issue. In some cases, they're fairly explicit. They're like, hey, don't worry, we're, we're just going to get exactly what we used to have. Um, but, uh, you know, without having the Supreme Court on our case. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's very easy to, I think, hear a story like that and think like, oh, that's really bad. I'm, I'm really sad that happened, like, in history. Um, in many cases, though, these codes are still on the books, right? Like in, in many U.S. cities or like, you know, in many cases, uh, in some cases, like they've actually gotten worse, right? They're even more restrictive. Um, so, for example, you know, a lot of cities didn't have um, maybe stuff like minimum parking requirements or even single family zoning or like, like New York city didn't have anything like single family zoning in 1916. That was a later addition. Um, and that's true of, of many other cities. So in many cases, these codes have actually gotten worse and you know, there's, there's pretty robust evidence, right? Cities that adopted these codes earlier, maybe 50 years down the road have much more extreme levels of segregation, both on the ba basis of race and class. Another one of the rules I go by is that you can have, you can put thumbs on the scale in very subtle ways or very explicit ways, as zoning is. A hundred years ago, and it could be racist to put those thumbs on the scale, but you run that story forward to modern day, and now there's a different constituency around it. Assume it's no longer about racism, but what is it about now in terms of maintaining these codes that maybe a 1926 code that was adopted by a bunch of racists, who, who are the constituency around it now? Yeah, so I think there's a few theories here. Um, you know, a theory that I highlight in the book is the, is the home voter hypothesis. It's essentially this notion that um, for most Americans, their largest investment is their home, naturally, uh, because, of course, we we heavily, heavily subsidize that in many ways, uh, including through tax policy. Um, and uh, so naturally, they respond to this by uh, advocating for policies that uh, increase the value of that asset. Uh, so that includes both um, uh, building less housing and make the quality of the housing higher. Um, so, you know, this is this notion of, of you know, essentially this original 1916 New York City thing of, great, I'm an incumbent uh, property owner. I want to increase the value of that. I want less supply coming online. Um, I think there's something to that uh, for sure. You know, I think it's a, it's a pretty you know, compelling case. Uh, and, and you can go to these planning hearings and people will literally say stuff like, I oppose this new development, it's going to lower my property value. <laughs> now, it's kind of funny because a lot of the evidence actually isn't great. So for example, there was a recent paper that came out that that even income restricted housing near you doesn't actually lower your property value, let alone like market rate multifamily or maybe it's something like a corner grocery. There's just not a lot of evidence that this lowers your property value. And this, I think it's maybe to the broader constituency for zoning is I think, you know, for the past 100 years, we've habituated people to think, OK, when you buy into a neighborhood, it's never going to change. And so I think people now they've responded to that regulatory framework to say, cool, I don't want my neighborhood to ever change. I'm going to be extremely conservative about any change that happens. And I'm just generally going to oppose anything changing in my neighborhood. 
Uh, and, you know, I think that's an extremely unhealthy sort of status quo that we found ourselves in. And, and it's going to be very hard to back out of that because it's not just, you know, there's a cultural element to it, I think. I like how you tell a story, which I've encountered these where you maybe have a, a, a new uh, constituency around maintaining or at least capping growth in cities. Uh, you tell about a, a meeting in California where they said, no, the problem is, is we just have too many people. Cities are dirty and they're environmentally harmful. And so one reason we just need to cap this is just to make sure, you know, that we're preserving land and we're, and we're doing a good job by the environment, um, which is a, a very common and completely wrongheaded way of looking at this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the nature of, of, the forces underwriting exclusionary zoning definitely changes in the second half of the 20th century. So it becomes, especially in a California context where this crisis is at its most extreme, it becomes much more of an environmental consideration. Uh, so people say, you know, we need to stop growth because, um, you know, growing cities is going to destroy the environment. Um, this is another, you know, less so with the first round of zoning. Yeah, I'm, I'm sympathetic to some of the concerns, right? You know, of course, you need to you need to protect truly outstanding natural areas. And, you know, of course, in the 70s, there were just a lot of incredible, unmitigated environmental issues, you know, uh, that that needed to be rectified. Uh, but, you know, I think to a certain extent, that generation overcorrected. And exactly like you said, right, there's, there's this uh, population growth control thinking that starts to seep in, which I think is a, is a very, a very nasty uh, way to look at the world. I mean, you essentially become a a Theranos, right? Uh, where you start to think like the problem is just there's too many people. And so we can solve all these problems by, um, uh, I guess, getting rid of people who are already here and stopping more people from arriving. Um, of course, that doesn't, you know, that doesn't actually work in the long term. And we're kind of at the end game of that, so to speak, uh, <laughs> here in California. Um, and um, so, you know, I think the irony here, too, I would say underwriting this is that cities are actually probably one of the one of the most incredible environmental institutions humanity's ever devised, right? So, um, of course, as people live maybe in homes on smaller lots or in multifamily buildings or in townhouses, they're consuming just less natural areas. So that that eases pressure on natural areas to be developed. Uh, but also, of course, uh, these types of housing just you know people in a townhouse or an apartment use less energy. Uh, they generally produce less trash. Uh, they're able to maybe walk or ride a bike or take transit which of course um, doesn't involve the uh, greenhouse gas emissions of driving. So, you know, again, I'm not, I don't approach this with, um, I think the way some urbanists approach it, where they say, you know, we need to force this type of development. Uh, you know, this is, we need to sort of corral people into communities like this. I, I think that's a little bit overstated, but people have made arguments like that. My argument is, hey, some people want to actually live in this really environmentally friendly sort of urban walkable lifestyle. Uh, why does government regulation stop them from doing that? And why does, at the same time, uh, this regulation effectively mandate and uh, aggressively subsidize a mode of living that actually has huge environmental costs? Um, and so, you know, I think zoning is 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 key to that. Zoning writes this into law that hey, everyone's going to live in a single family home out on the periphery, and they're going to drive everywhere for all their trips. Again, no problem if you want that, but the idea that the state should be involved in enforcing that, I think, is completely wrongheaded. Now, let's uh, as you do in the book, let's steel man zoning here for a bit. Uh, there's one obvious one, and we've kind of brought it up, that essentially is to say that there are there are conflicting land uses, uh, whether that's a glue factory, as you brought up, or or a beer garden uh, in a residential area or a high urban residential area where beer gardens can get pretty loud. Um, so all different types of ways that property rights and different uses can conflict. So one of the things that we should be doing, and this is not like crazy, is maybe preempting those. So we could solve them ex post. We could solve them after, you know, the beer garden goes into place and then makes everyone upset because they're, it's super loud at 2 a.m. Uh, or we could just make sure that it never happens in the first place and say we won't have any, you know, permitting of large, of large bars or whatever sort of zoning restriction is going to keep that kind of conflict from happening. And of course, the glue factory would be another one and all different types of conflict in between. So that's it, it's taking away, like, I mean, I think this is important. You know, there are many things that begin racist, but it doesn't make them still racist today. Uh, you know, minimum wage had many people who supported it for racist purposes. It doesn't make people who support minimum wage today racist. So just take the best argument here and say, take away the, the sordid history and say, this general idea is not crazy by itself. And maybe that's, you know, not the wrong approach when creating a city. 
Yeah, I, I just want to say, I think I said uh, earlier, I think I said Theranos instead of Thanos. You did say Theranos. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm a big Marvel fan. It's Thanos. Yeah, yeah. Theranos is Sorry. the, it's the uh, blood company. Yes. <laughs> I, I always get the two mixed. It, it's it's great that these two great villains like are so e- close. But also exactly, so exactly. I had to address that before I get a thousand replies on uh, on your Twitter and my Twitter. So excuse exactly. me. Exactly. Thanos, we're in the end game. Ha ha. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> to your point, right? Steel Manning zoning. Yeah. So I think this is really important to do uh, before we kind of set up the case for getting rid of zoning. Um, so, you know, I think, as I said earlier in the conversation, zoning is trying to do two things. It's trying to segregate land uses and and restrict density. Um, so I think, you know, the most sympathetic argument for maybe let's take the segregate uses piece is, of course, there are certain uses that are incompatible. Like there are certain types of uses that just make bad neighbors. Um, now there's like extreme and obvious examples of this. Like I don't want an oil refinery like opening up next to my house. Um, but also there's like subtle examples, like, you know, a bar might be fine, but if a bar that like blasts really loud music and has smokers like hanging out out front until 4 a.m., I don't want that near me, right? And I'm highly sympathetic to people who are concerned about stuff like that. Um, zoning comes in and it's 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 kind of a blunt instrument way of solving that problem. It's saying like, okay, like flat out, you know, uh, we're going to solve most of this problem by saying there's industrial districts and there's commercial districts. And yeah, there might be some bars that would be nice to have in a residential neighborhood, uh, but we're just gonna we're just gonna solve this problem like completely and say like no no commercial in residential areas and there are even more ambiguous edge cases right like corner groceries um, a lot of people might like a corner grocery in their neighborhood certainly that's the most desirable neighborhood in many U S cities has has developments like this but other people might say you know I don't want the traffic generation I don't want the strangers coming into my neighborhood I don't want oh I I don't want the you know, the smells of, of 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 a garbage can in the background. Um, and so, yeah, zoning is just a, a really, really blunt instrument for solving these problems. I, you know, I would say you can go out and look in, in heavily zoned places like New York City and L.A. and still find conflicts that fly under the radar. Uh, or I think in many cases, um, this is used in, 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 in discriminatory ways. So, for example, the, the densest forms of housing are generally only allowed in areas near industry or commercial. But, yeah, I think it, there's a sense in which if done right, this, this system makes sense. The second is, you know, of course, like it's somewhat obvious, right? Of course, like growth needs to be coordinated with infrastructure, um, you know, and so there's two ways of doing that. There's the have the infrastructure follow the growth uh, or have the have the development follow the infrastructure. And zoning is essentially opting for the second uh, way of solving that problem, saying, you know, hey, we're only going to allow new development near uh, where we have inf- infrastructure capacity. Um, I think this argument fails. I think the, the two arguments fail. Uh, right, uh, as I as I suggest in the book, you know, I'd say on the first piece of the of the use segregation, um, the first is that you know, of course, there are like obvious and extreme cases of like the oil refinery next to the home, but we actually solved that problem for the most part, um, both with regulation and through market. So these land uses just don't want to be in the same places, right? Like the oil refinery doesn't want to be next to the home either. Uh, Partly because that's going to be, you know, potential litigation and complaining, but also partly because like that oil refinery needs to be on like major transportation infrastructure or maybe next to a port. And of course, that's not the ideal place to have a single family home. Of course, that doesn't solve all problems. Like there's still going to be uh, elements like that. But then, too, you can have regulations that, that that solve that problem without having something so extreme and destructive as zoning. You can just say, hey, if you're a heavy industry, we're going to have a heavy industry district and you can go to town in that district. but we are going to restrict you to that district. And historically, that's what cities did pre-zoning. They would take the most noxious uses like slaughterhouses uh, or tanneries and say, all right, you know, sorry, um, you're a slaughterhouse. You do have to be out on the edge of town. Um, and, you know, that's as we can talk about in the case of Houston, that's essentially how Houston solves some of these problems. So they pick these truly offensive uses and they say, OK, we are going to have maybe something kind of like districting for you, but we're not going to do this weird game where we like separate duplexes from single family homes. And I would say the other element of the of the use segregation piece is I would say the way to solve these problems is to actually regulate impacts. Um, so, you know, like if you're worried about smells or if you're worried about traffic generation, um, maybe we couldn't measure these things really effectively in 1916, but we can definitely measure these things now. Uh, noise is, I think, a great one because you look at many cities' noise ordinances and it'll be like one or two sentences and it'll be like, you know, no noise unreasonable to a person with, you know, excellent hearing after 10 p.m. And you're like, 
this is like medieval like ordinance, right? Uh, it's like we can do much, like we can we can set like pretty clear standards, and we can also measure this and say and hold people to it in a really systematic way. Or same with traffic generation, or same with 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 smoke or, or smells get a little bit more complicated. But I'm 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 optimistic about the capacity for for our uh, city planners to solve that problem. The second piece too is I think uh, with coordinating growth with infrastructure. I think we just have it backwards, right? Um, you know, you don't you don't stop growth until you have the infrastructure. The infrastructure should be following the growth, right? So, you know, I draw a lot on the on the former World Bank urban planner Alain Berto in the book, where you know what we need to be doing is we need to be sit down, we need to sit down, have a realistic conversation about the growth that's coming, the infrastructure that's going to be required, and we need to start planning to accommodate it. Right. As opposed to this notion of, OK, like we're going to restrict development until, you know, we have enough infrastructure to get out to you. Uh, these things need to be working in tandem. And of course, they need to be interacting. But this notion of like, OK, let's just stop growth uh, and we'll get around to the infrastructure piece eventually. I think it's just the, the problem uh, understood in reverse. So you've mentioned Houston a couple of times. Let's talk about uh, how this famously unzoned city of of Houston, Texas, uh looks and, and what it allows and how it goes about solving some of these these problems that you mentioned that are in, in themselves inevitable if you live in a city. Yeah. So Houston is really fascinating. It's America's uh, fourth largest city, probably soon to be third largest city. Sorry, Chicago. Uh, and Houston is interesting because it doesn't have zoning. Um, Houston doesn't have zoning because they're the only major city that actually put zoning to a referendum. And in all three referenda, it failed. Uh, mostly from opposition from from working class Houstonians of all races. Um, now Houston's a little bit weird, like as an example for my case, right? Because I'm at pains to say this in the book. Houston made almost every other government planning mistake you could have made in the 20th century, right? So they they did bad urban renewal. They they you know they built urban freeways that destroyed neighborhoods, and and they made a whole bunch of planning mistakes. And and uh, you know I stress all that in the book. But I argue that Houston's really interesting because they didn't make this one really big planning mistake, and that's they didn't adopt zoning. Um, and so as a result of that, you know, Houston has become one of the most affordable and one of the most diverse major cities in the U.S. It's this place where it's very easy to maybe take a single family home and turn it into two or three townhouses. It's very easy to take maybe a former uh, strip mall on a major corridor and turn that into ground floor shops with apartments over top. Um, in any other U.S. city, these would be these huge ordeals. They would require huge zoning uh, rewrites. They would require huge planning studies. Um, in Houston, because they have this flexible land use framework, uh, it's just able to happen. Now, that's not to say that Houston doesn't have any land use regulations. Uh, far from it. They have a lot of rules that regulate, for example, you know, uses that are going to be offensive just about no matter where they go. Uh, they have rules regulating impacts, things like noise or stormwater management. Um, and then, of course, they have this very, very interesting system of private deed restrictions, essentially a private form of land use regulation where people who want maybe something other than non-zoning can voluntarily opt into something that might look like zoning. So I think that, you know, is this an ideal arrangement? You know, I don't know. Uh, but we're operating in a no perfect solutions policy environment. And what I think you have is you have a lot of people who want something like maybe that R1 zoning district that only allows single family homes, doesn't allow apartments or commercial and uh, requires two, two car garages, uh, you know, a 30 foot deep front yard. Uh, some people want that. And the question is, like, what's the best way to satisfy that preference? Um, you can have the government come in and say, like, we're going to impose that and enforce it until the end of time. Or you can say, hey, if you want to voluntarily opt into that, the city will back you up. We won't issue permits that don't comply with that. But you have to voluntarily opt into it. You have to play a role. You have to cover some of the cost of enforcement. And you have to at least regularly, somewhat regularly, have some of a conversation about whether you want to change or renew or let those rules expire. And so, you know, in, in parts of Houston, of course, you you end up getting some neighborhoods that look like maybe an R1 zoned neighborhood. But then in huge portions of the city, uh, you have almost total freedom of property owners to do what they like with their property. And so it's a compromise that I think works and has made has made Houston uniquely functional among American cities. Uh, it's a little bit provocative because we're not used to thinking of Houston as like this planning model. But I actually think in this in this particular sense, uh, they, they, they actually are a, a leader in many senses. There's a political economy story there too, because if you have gone down a bad path toward establishing a system of privileges and extreme vested interests, which of course is a lot of what government does in many different ways, the only way to get out of it might be that you have to kind of give them a little something uh, 
uh, in the core, in the practical course of moving toward a more free, less planned oriented kind of way, which is what they did. They kind of gave them, you know, you, you want this, here you go, you can have this. But as you point out, the end, the end policy prescription is abolish zoning. Like it just, it just is. Why, why go that far? Why is, why is that the sensible position here? Yeah, you know, I think we're living in a really great moment where uh, there's a lot of reform happening. Um, uh, so, right, so of course you have the YIMBY movement all across the country, uh, you know, pushing for the end of the most extreme forms of exclusionary zoning, stuff like single family zoning or parking mandates or really, really large minimum lot sizes, all these things that restrict what people can do with their property and just make it really, really hard to build. Um, and so that's great. You know, in the near term, I think reforming a lot of those regulations makes a lot of sense. Uh, but for for reasons I set out in the book, I think you know we can take the argument a step further. You know, I think for these for all the reasons that I've set out, right, both in terms of the contemporary costs and then the historical origins of this policy, I think it's okay to just admit, like, hey, you know, um, zoning isn't like this good policy that was misapplied that we can do better. Um, zoning is deeply dysfunctional, and it has you know objectives that I don't think reasonable people today would support. And to the extent that it has you know, I think real planning applications, it hasn't really achieved those. Uh, and the proof is kind of in the pudding with a lot of U.S. cities. Um, you know, and I think when you when you really look at what the alternatives might look like, um, it starts to look starts to look pretty desirable, right? Um, you know, we can have a city where there's a lot of flexibility in terms of, you know, what land uses can go where, but we can also have, you know, pretty clear and, 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 and transparent regulation on things like impacts. Or we can say, hey, if you want, uh, stricter land use regulations within your community, you can voluntarily opt into them and that's okay. You don't need to take the whole city down with you, <laughs> right? So to speak. Um, but so, you know, I set this vision out and, and of course I, I, I try to stress in the book, you know, I don't think this means, uh, there's no role for, for planning, uh, far from it. I actually think we don't do a lot of things that, that many people actually, uh, think planners do and want them to do. You know, so of course I worked as a planner and the typical planner in the U.S. today just spends so much time micromanaging, you know, the number of parking spaces for strip malls or trying to keep fourplexes out of single family homes or uh, getting yelled at at crazy public hearings at, you know, on a Thursday at 10 a.m. Um, this is like not the best use of like uh, city planning capacity. Uh, and meanwhile, for example, a lot of cities don't even do street plans. Right. So this is why. American suburbia ends up kind of having this kind of chaotic and incomprehensible form is that we don't actually sit down and do the things that government actually might be relatively good at, which is like sit down and like just come up with a street grid and let people do what they want on their property. Uh, but they have absolute certainty of like, hey, this is where the street's going to go. Um, this is like going to be the width of the street. And, you know, beyond that, go for it. Uh, you know, like that's, this is an important thing for for municipal planners to be doing is to stewarding the public realm. And we actually don't do a lot of that. You know, planners are so focused on what people are doing on their private property that in many cases, like the actual public realm has just really gone to hell in the U.S. And we get these streets that are, are poorly designed if they're designed at all. And we, you know, we get communities where maybe there's not a park within walking distance of where you live. Or we live in communities where, you know, the, the school is way out on the edge of town and it's designed like a prison compound. Uh, and you, of course, have to drive there. You can't walk there. Um, I would contend that, 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 that planners... Uh, are misused uh, in this sort of crazy zoning system. And that actually they could be much more effectively used doing the things that I think people across the ideological spectrum would agree. Uh, yeah, okay, this is actually what government might be good at. You know, setting baseline rules of the game for urban growth and expansion and then stepping back and letting cities uh, design themselves. There's something very quixotic about some of these plans. I remember in my hometown of Denver, there in the Colorado History Museum, there is a... You can see the city plan of like 1958, uh, which I think was projected to be a 50-year plan. So we're going to plan the city out for up to 2008, if what you think about it is just kind of bonkers. And then and so you could do this in two different ways. You could say, all right, well, let's just build the streets out and say, you know, here, here's the good sensible street thing if you want to put your house there. But we're not going to say how many people can live in that house because we don't really know what kind of living situation people are going to need in the future. We might be living like Popular Mechanics Magazine in 1958 or we might be living in an urban hellscape. Either way, we're not exactly sure what people are going to want to do with their housing and their commercial and their industry in 2008. So 
I mean, it, that's the hubris you discussed because a lot of those plans are like 50 years long, which of course goes against every kind of idea that there's an organicness to letting people make choices and trade-offs and figure out which ones they want as opposed to someone else telling them which ones they're allowed to do. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I get very Hayekian, right, uh, on this stuff. So like, what can like government planners know and what can they not know? Um, you know, I think there's a reasonable case to be made of, hey, you know, there's like a planner can can add real value by setting down and laying some basic rules of the game and saying, you know, we're going to have we're going to have rules on measurable impacts. And uh, you know, with absolute certainty that like extreme nuisance uses are going to be in certain areas and not this area. And there's going to be a street grid and it's going to follow this relative pattern. And there's going to be parks every so many blocks. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, do what you like. Right. Because I think planners, that that type of knowledge is absolutely not the type of thing that can be aggregated into a plan. Um, Right. This I mean, this is really what zoning is trying to do. Zoning is saying what every what what use is allowed on every single lot and at what density over a 50 year time span. I mean, this is like nutty stuff. Right. You you don't have to be like um, um, inhaling Hayek to start to see like some of the concerns with this. Right. Like it's we just can't know. Like imagine how much Denver has changed over the course of 50 years. We just can't know that. We can know with relative certainty that, yeah, Denver in 50 years should have a street grid and um, Denver in 50 years should have uh, maybe some parks regularly spread out around the city. Uh, Great. That's what planning should be doing. Uh, What we can't know is, yeah, there should be a supermarket on this corner and this street should just be single family homes and they should have uh, four bedrooms uh, and, you know, all of this other stuff that gets baked into zoning. And so, of course, like these ordinances, the older they get, the more just crazy out of line with reality they are. And, you know, in a city like New York City, um, they're operating on a zoning ordinances that, w- that was largely written in 1961. Um, I would contend that New York City has slightly changed between 1961 and 2022. I'll give you an example of this, right? Many U.S. cities, of course, as I've mentioned multiple times in this conversation, uh, impose single family zoning. So only like a single family home on a single family lot. Um a, 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 nor- a planning norm that I think was really, really developed in the 50s through the 70s at a time when, you know, the, there were the nuclear family was really strong. Right. Uh, maybe family sizes were were probably double what they were now. Um, families were larger. Uh, you had more multi-generational families. You needed more space and you had a lot more young children. Um, of course, in many uh, metropolitan areas, the form of the family has changed. Right. Uh, more people are living alone. Maybe they want more studio or one bedroom units. Or, or maybe more people want to live in, in co-living arrangements that, you know, might involve, you know, a, a private bedroom and a private bathroom, but maybe a shared kitchen. There are all these different small ways that society changes that zoning just kind of basically just throws gears, uh, sand in the gears, right? Um, and, and just slows people running these experiments with ways of living and ways of engaging in a city. Um, and, you know, I think that's like, I don't get too much into this uh, in the book, but I think that's like a deeper cost of zoning. It's just all these experiments that, that people could have been running and all these different ways of of living and engaging with a city that we could have been exploring uh, that we just don't get to do because zoning keeps cities in a straitjacket. And so, you know, I think there's this sense in which the project of the book is is negative and, and critical and, you know, sort of saying, hey, this this policy hasn't worked. It, it sucks. We should get rid of it. Uh, all of which I think is true. But I think there's a, there's a real positive project here uh, in terms of, you know, hey, what does the next American city look like? Uh, this is a this is actually a really exciting opportunity when you really think of how much zoning has constrained uh, the cities that we live in. You know, we there are, there's all these innovations and all this uh, potential progress that's just sort of we're leaving on the table, and uh, and that that includes planners, right? I mean, we can develop systems of land use regulation uh, that actually make cities better and more livable and more comfortable, uh, and we can have planners do things that are actually socially valuable and useful. Uh, and they're largely wasted today. That's something that I've been surprised. You know, I expected a little bit of blowback uh, among some of my my planning colleagues. Uh, and mm, the typical, of course, you know, the person who hates the book probably isn't going to message me. The person who really hates the book is definitely going to message me. But the person who's just lightly irritated by the book is going to like ignore me. Uh, but I've been impressed by how many people have reached out to me saying like, you know, hey, I'm a practicing planner. I'm so glad you said this, and uh, I totally hear you, right? Like, I work with some really great, smart people, and we're just being wasted on this zoning system. So, you know, I think there's a really, really exciting city uh, city waiting on the other end of of zoning, and it's just kind of waiting there to be discovered. Thanks for listening. 
If you enjoy Free Thoughts, make sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Landry Ayers. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at libertarianism.org.